anyone else joins in a little bit late, we got it. Thanks a lot, Joel. If anyone joins in a little bit late, um, they will catch up or they can always just ask a couple of questions and they'll be back up to speed. So I'm going to start share and I'm going to kick right in. Let me make sure I have my presentation up and ready first. Hold on. I have too many files open. Yeah, close that file. Close this one. So I'm in the middle of multiple tasks today. And um, so I have so many files open. One second, guys. One second. And here we are. Super. Gonna put into Prezi mode. Excellent. Now, I will encourage you guys to ask questions. Feel free to put up your hand um, or jump on the mic and ask a question at any point in time. I'm very open to that. Um, worst case scenario is we don't have time to take the question and I'll defer it to later and try to answer it a little later on, okay? But I do have a question for you guys right now. And I'll invite you to jump on the mic or jump on the chat and give a response. What do you think is marketing, right? Whether you're from the entrepreneurship bootcamp class or in Dr. Pacheco's class, um, we're all in the same group here. So let's have a nice little chat a little, at least for a minute or so about that. What do you guys think marketing is all about? What is involved in marketing? Now pay attention to the chat. Don't answer all at once, but take your time. Think of it. What's involved in marketing, guys? And I'll tell you something. Oh, I'm getting some answers. What is this? Michael says, marketing is creating value for customers and building prof profitable relationships in order to obtain value from customers in return. Okay, I like it. You're going good so far, Michael. Um, somebody who is named Guest Marketing, so you didn't change your name, says communicating value to potential customers. I like the idea of communicating value, right? You know, I, I love that, that response. And then Sanjeev says, gathering and analyzing data about the target audience. So between those three marketing, those three responses there, guys, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with those three responses. Um, communicating, and you use the word value, which is excellent, but also gathering. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that and some of the steps and processes that you can use to do that, right? So marketing is about conducting research. So we talk about gathering information, right? So let's just add a little extra word to it. Conducting research on the marketing environment, not just from customers, right? So you're gathering intelligence and gathering feedback from customers, right? That's good. You want that. But you also want information about the market environment and conditions. What is happening? Who else is there in the mix? What are some of the challenges, opportunities, you know, things that we have to think about in the environment? So now all of that is involved in marketing, right? And as you rightly said, guys, I think it was Sanjeev, promoting and selling products. In other words, communicating. That's when you communicate, you're saying words or you're using language or you're using visuals, content, etc. Message, a message is going out there, right? And what is the message about? Well, it's the value. What, what is your value? What is the value that you offer? And that's, that's the message that goes about. So sometimes we sell something. Customers don't understand the true worth or the true value or the features and the components that make up the value that really if they only knew that there was that also in this product or there was that other experience or there was, you know, wow, those benefits, we didn't know. So sometimes you have to communicate that. 
right? So it's, it's important. And I'll say this as well. Me just working with entrepreneurs, right? So just sort of when I'm financing or mentoring or working on a project with entrepreneurs, what I find, in my opinion, right? And you could chime in. We know that a lot of businesses don't always do so well. They're not always successful. As a matter of fact, if you just Google success rate or failure rate for businesses and business startups, you will find invariably that the failure rate is very high. Some statistics quote 80%, some say 90%, some say 75%. It kind of varies around there. Okay, guys? But what's the reason for such a high rate? Can't we just start a business and be successful? Just like that? Why can't we just go start, register a business now, start running it, and make money? What's the problem? In my view, I see two things that entrepreneurs kind of fall short on. One is financial analysis. And that includes financial forecasting, financial planning, and understanding the, the dynamics of their sales, revenue, expenses, um, their investment that they made in their business and how long it takes to return and recover that big investment. And that's tricky because I don't know if you have arithmophobia. We don't like spreadsheets or we don't like to calculate numbers or we don't like numbers crunching. I don't know what it is, but we seem to not be doing that. And this is not just in Trinidad. This is this is uh, everywhere. You know, entrepreneurs tend to not do that too well. And I think it's because they are so product focused. They're so, you know, enamored with their business idea, the product that they're selling, whether it is maybe they're in the garment industry or they invented some technology. And they're so proud of that, that they forget to consider that has to be monetized in some way. And you have to do some financial planning about, you know, to make that successful. But the other area, the other big area is not enough thorough market assessment and marketing activity. More so market assessment. I think a lot of people these days using social media for a lot of their market activity, which is fine, that works. But you also have to be strategic. You can't just put content or say words on social media and hope that the message gets across. Sometimes you put in a lot of information on social media and you see the communication part the message saying words and putting pictures is not necessarily effective communication you have to know what and how okay but i think apart from financial planning the other big area is market assessment and for both you guys in the class in the marketing class on the dr pacheco as well as for those of you in the NEDCO Entrepreneurship Bootcamp. You have, you in the NEDCO Bootcamp, guys, you have to do a pitch proposal in a couple of weeks using a PowerPoint slide deck and stand up and present your idea. One of the things that those judges are going to be sitting down listening to very keenly, they are going to want to hear what is your marketing strategy market entry and market development strategy. And what is that based on? In other words, is it supported by some form of market research? How did you arrive at that strategy? What was your market research findings that informs that? Investors these days, they're not investing in just products because it sounds good. They invest in because they understand based on your research that there's strong market potential here, right? Is that upon you see? Okay, let's move on a little bit. I normally show this slide. Every you, everybody who's been to one of my workshops or classes, they're all familiar with this slide by now. I use it almost every time, right? You guys who are in the Netco Bootcamp, you've seen this at least twice now. And I bring it back all the time to reiterate and reinforce a particular point. Right? Somebody says something in the chat. Let me go and see what it says. Tiffany says, yes. Right, Tiffany, you've seen it. By now, I should ask you guys to explain it for me. And you could explain it. 
I wouldn't, wouldn't do that right now, but maybe next time. But this diagram is my version of, and a simplified version, guys, of what generally happens in an entrepreneurship cycle, in, in, in the early stages of business. And it goes through stages one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the different steps. And as you recall, step one is where you come up with the idea from whatever methodology. Maybe you had a brainstorming session, maybe you woke up in the middle of the night and it hit you, or you were part of a focus group, whatever, whatever happened. But you you came up with an idea. You then sort of troubleshoot the idea a little bit using actual material, not expensive material, rudimentary material. In other words, you wanted to get to proof of concept. You wanted to take the idea, do a simple model of it, a simple prototype, prototype, if you will, or a sample, if it's pepper sauce, and you make a little batch, and you, you, you taste it, and you ask some people, you, you did a simple batch to prove that, yep, I'm onto something. I'm going to skip step three and I go to step four. So I'm going to come back to step three. At step four is where you start planning for how you're going to make money with this business idea. That's your business model canvas. Those of you who are in the marketing class, if you're, if you're anywhere near to Dr. Ankisun's class, probably Dr. Pacheco's class as well, you would have heard business model canvas before. If you haven't, don't worry. I'm going to give you a little insight on that a little later in, a, in this presentation. But a business model canvas is a tool. It's a little form. It's like a template that you can use to design the model of a business. Design the model, meaning this is how we would implement this idea that we came up with in a commercial way. This is how we would sell it. This is the structure, resources, market strategy, etc. This is how we would do it. That's what a business model does. Well, you can actually take an idea, pat yourself on the back, and say, I love it. It's great. I made it. It's such a good idea. And jump straight into business model and go try to sell it. You can, nothing, nobody's stopping you from doing that. But it's actually better and wiser to do some checks, to do a little research before you're, implement your idea because from the time you start implementing that idea commercially it means you're spending money on equipment you might even hire some staff you purchase some raw material to get things going you know you you might even start off marketing doing a marketing plan creating flyers brochures building a website you're going all gung ho down the road only to realize you turn out to be one of the 80 percent that didn't make it and asking yourself, why? How did this happen? Well, one could have been not enough financial analysis, but another could have been, well, you didn't actually do some thorough enough market assessment before you launched right into this business idea. And guess what? Financiers, investors, and partners. If you didn't do your market assessment or your financial planning, as far as they're concerned, you're on your own with that business idea. So. Doing marketing is really a key prerequisite to having a solid plan. It's, 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 the, it's the backbone, it's the framework for what you're going to do next. It really is part of, if I get the market research right, I now have the correct market intelligence to formulate my strategy to go forward. So that's what market research does for you. And investors, or you go to the bank, whether it's Republic Bank or Netco, and you say you're looking for a loan to start a business, that's what they will ask. In addition to your business plan, they will be scrutinizing your business plan to see the little chapter or the little section that says market research. Because they want to be confident and assured that the strategy, figures, and plans that you have outlined there didn't fall out of the sky. It's based on some sort of research. So I normally share this diagram to show you the different steps and processes, but also to show the sequence of what you should do when and when. So that business model canvas comes in at step four. After you've done, well, your ideation, 
preliminary testing and prototyping and then do a little market research. There's levels of market research you can do. Eh? You can do a basic stress test or you can go full-blown detailed market investigation full works, right? But most of the time, if you did a, a good stress test, you're gonna gather some good intelligence to allow you to go forward. Usually that's the most effective anyway, because sometimes business ideas and business projects are so new, sometimes very innovative. Sometimes the best test is actually to launch on a small scale and almost like beta test the product. In other words, sell at a very small level, but you're gathering intelligence of how the product performed in a live environment. In other words, a live business. That's also good. That's also a form of market research as well. Right? Okay. I put this little feedback loop inside there because you can gather market information once your business is launched, which is exactly what I was explaining just now with the beta testing. You can launch your company and are constantly in market research mode, you know. Market research is, the point therefore is not something that you do as a prerequisite step in step three before you do stage four, which is your business model canvas, and then lock off the pipe and say, well, that's it. No need for any more market research. We now know what to do. Let's go down the road. Market research is something that you want to constantly do. Why? Because the environment is constantly changing. Even your customers are evolving and growing over time. They're getting older. They're having new experiences. They, they're doing different things. And so their perspective on, on life and their perspective on how they feel about your product changes over time. And sometimes ongoing market research allows you to keep in tune and up to date with the mindset, the mindset and the thinking of your customer base. Okay, all right. I'm gonna do one more slide and then I'll pause for some questions. Actually, no, I'll use this slide to ask some questions. I will ask you some questions. And we just spoke about it. So I know you guys have the answers all now. Why is marketing important? Why should we do marketing? Do I really need to ask that? Because you know already, we've just explained it. But let's, let's, let's get some conversation going. Why is marketing important? You can give me one response in the chat. Why you think we should do marketing? To not waste resources. Alia, you get a thumbs up. Anyone else? We don't want to waste resources. So we did marketing to check. Anything else? To raise awareness about the company's products and services. Sanjeev, I like that answer. It's similar to the one before, but I still like it. It's a good answer. Anything else? To, uh, to reach, uh -huh. to penetrate the market, to, to reach. I like that word, right? from coming from guest and to make customers aware of the brand or product and get by it. Okay. All those are excellent responses. I'll share with you some of my responses, right? So it allows you to establish a relationship with your customer. So yes, you're communicating your message and yes, you can gather feedback Right, so you communicate in one way and the customer is communicating back to you the other way, right? When two people start talking to each other often, they start building a relationship, you know? So marketing allows you not just to communicate, hey, this is what I have, this is the value, this is the best, and to hear from customers, I like it, I don't like it. But it also helps you to kind of form a little relationship with your customer base. You may eventually develop a a profile of customers that typically think a certain way, maybe of a certain age, maybe even of a certain gender or something like that. You might 
form a relationship with a certain grouping of people. And they become loyal to you and your product. Now you have uh, that relationship. That is important. That kind of creates brand loyalty. And someone mentioned buy-in, right? That's a nice word. So you could create a, a little relationship with your customer base. And that's important, right? Like every other relationship, if it's a good one, people believe in you. They believe in the product. They like the brand. You know, they're not as easily influenced by the others, right? They will come to you because you have a relationship. And you're trying to nurture and foster not just communication channels here, but you're also trying to build a relationship with your customer base. It allows you, by doing marketing, the activity, the work of doing marketing, the research that is involved, the building the relationship, the feedback going back and forth, you, you start learning more about not just where the customers are, was the age, was the spending power. So you learn those things, right? But you start understanding how the customers feel. And feeling is important in business. Why? Because unfortunately, we are not always rational, logical, clear-cut thinking being there, very often we make decisions based on how we feel. And in business, it's just like that. Sometimes we feel a certain way and we make a choice. You know, I, I like how that outfit make me feel, so I, I buy that outfit, right? I need my chocolate fix today, so I buy some chocolate ice cream because I, I, I need to feel a little good today because it's a long day. We buy things sometimes based on how we feel. Consumers do that. Investors do the same thing, eh? Let me tell you, you go to a bank and you ask for a loan. Basically, you are a potential purchaser of a loan facility. And the banker has the option to either sell it to you or not sell it to you. And they could make that choice too, just like how you could make that choice of banks. And sometimes... They make that choice based on how they feel about you. So sometimes when you go for a loan, you're doing a little bit of marketing yourself. Eh? You have to, that's what the pitch proposal is all about. You go for an investment facility, you got to do a little marketing. That's what the pitch is all about. If I have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And it allows you to have a better promotional strategy. If you understand how customers feel, not just where they are, where they're located, what they age, et cetera, et cetera. So you could zero in on them, right? If you also understand how they feel, you can create a promotional strategy. What do I mean by promotional strategy? That's the communication that someone mentioned earlier. What do you communicate? How do you communicate it? Where do you communicate it? What medium do you use? Colors, pictures, words, lingo, language, all of those things influence the message that is heard. Eh? And the more you know about how and why and when does a customer think in a certain way, you will actually create a strategy that speaks directly to them in the way that they want to hear it. That's what effective marketing, and including promotion, is all about. Advertising and promotion is really about effective communication. It's not just saying words. Okay? And of course, if you did that well, you can. You are now in a position of influence. You can now influence the way someone thinks. If you're really good at your craft as a marketer, it is in a certain sense a craft. Eh? You, you get marketing executives getting paid big bucks, guys, to come up with marketing strategy. And it's not just coming up with an advertising campaign. It's they know who their audience is. They know how their audience thinks, where they're located, what raises their antennas, what gets them back. They know because they've done their market research. So when they craft a marketing strategy to influence their buyer choices, those marketing executives get paid good money because they know how to do that. Right? It's an exciting field, very exciting field, guys.
Okay. Before I go into the business model canvas, let me pause right here and take any questions that you have. I pause every now and again, like every five, 10 minutes or so. I know I went more than 10 minutes. Just to sort of give you a little break to think and ask a question or two. Going once, going twice, everybody's okay. What is the best way to build customer relationships? Well, this is what I'm talking about. So building, building relationship with any being, a customer is a person. It's about communication. That's what it boils down to. Any sort of relationship that you want to build, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, husband and wife, teacher, student, right? Business, B2B, business to customer. Any type of relationship you can possibly think of. The foundation of that relationship is open, honest communication. That's what it boils down to. If you're in business, and you're selling a product, be open and honest about the values, the benefits, the features, the attractiveness about your product. Customers start getting confidence in what you say. They start believing in the brand. They start trusting the brand. And they, they do their part to, towards strengthening the relationship on their side. You got to do your part in meeting the customer's expectations for quality as much you're right um for you know price appropriateness and for communicating you know the benefits features and even any sort of limitations that your product may or may not have product or service it's communication that's what it boils down to not over communication you always have something to say every day appropriate strategic well-balanced, good thinking communication that thinks of the other person, right? So, you know, Jeff Bezos, for example, when you ask him, not me personally, I never spoke to him, but I, I Googled his responses, in case you're wondering. When you asked him, um, what's the most important thing that he has done to be so successful in his business? right? Amazon.com, which is one of the, if, if not the most successful um, shopping platform you could possibly get, followed closely by maybe I don't know, Alibaba, right? But he simply says, he listens to his customers, he understands what they want, and he delivers it. And he dropped the mic. That's it. He listens, understands, and delivers, right? Like anything else, if you can't deliver, simply say, okay, I can't do this, but here's what I can offer. So best way to build a relationship is communication. How you communicate, what you communicate, when you communicate, that depends on your degree of understanding of that person. And your customer is a person, you gotta understand this person, right? Okay. Now, let me get some feedback now. I know in the um, bootcamp class, I went through this with you on Tuesday. So I know if I ask how many of you seen this, the bootcamp class is going to say yes. But I want to just check the marketing students because you may not have come to this part of your training as yet in this first semester. How many of you have heard of the business model canvas? Let me see some some responses in the chat. Aha. No, Alia, you are in the boot camp, not so? Is this the name BMC on the entry? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, Alia, you in you are not in the boot camp. Okay, that's fine. Lovely. I'm seeing a lot of yeses. 
You are in Natasha's class already, guys, uh, also? Yes? Okay, excellent. So you're going to know what I'm talking about. Business model canvas, sort of central to your business planning, right? And I'll show you why, how, how and why marketing comes in here. It's, it's so important. This business model canvas is basically a framework for how you would structure your business. It describes what the value proposition is, who's the target market. It describes your communication strategies on one side. And on the other side, it has all of the activities, operating activities, resources that drive those activities, et cetera, et cetera. This is what the business model canvas does. Central to the business model canvas, in my view, and I encourage you to adopt that view as well, is the marketing strategy. You can't build out a business model canvas fully unless you first start with your marketing strategy. And if you notice, I've just shifted from here to here, which I'm basically just zeroing in now on one side of the business model canvas. This side of the business model canvas is your marketing strategy. Essentially, anybody ask, okay, take care. Anybody, whether you're working in a company or you you got a job as some marketing manager or anything like that, anybody says to you, can you do a business, uh, sorry, a marketing strategy? This, these are the components of a marketing strategy. Your value proposition, right down the center. Over on the other side, who are your target customer segments and what is their profile. Towards the middle of this section, you have your customer relations. This is your communication strategy, your advertising, your promotion, your feedback pro processes. That's your communication strategy. That's how you build a relationship. And then underneath that, you have your channels, which is your marketing and distribution channels. How does actual product and service get to the customer? How do they see it? Where do they, where do they interface with it? Those channels and the strategy for that is important for allowing the customer to purchase, engage, and interface with its product. The communication channels allow the customer to be aware and for you to be aware of how customer feels, et cetera. So this component here is basically what you sell, who you sell it to, and here I'm reading from the right, the left now, how you will advertise it, where you will advertise it, and where will customers be able to buy. That's basically your marketing strategy right there. Now, if you did that, as I'm, let me rephrase that. Once you did that, half the battle is done. Any business plan starts with your marketing strategy. Because once you did that, now you know how to plan out the operational component of your business. The operational side of your business, the activities, what you will do, and the resources that you are required to, to engage to do those activities depend on your marketing plan. It depends on what you're going to do from a marketing perspective, what product you're going to come up with, features, benefits, all of those things drive what you will now have to do to run this business. And that will in turn drive your operating costs and your capital investment. It, it, it basically dictates everything on the operational implementation side of your business model canvas. Right? So everybody got that point. Now, Central to this relationship here is the value proposition and customer segment. We just, we've been speaking about that. This is at the heart of it, right? Your customer relationships, who they are, where they're located, how they think, how they feel, what their preferences, those persons and your value proposition must be talking to each other. They must be in sync. If they're not in sync, you're misaligned. If you're misaligned, you're basically trying to Sell ice to Eskimo, right? They, they don't need it. Okay, so you have to be in sync. How do you get in sync? I'm just going to touch on this very quickly. You might have seen this before. This is a value proposition canvas. It's essentially the same where I have the arrows pointing to the value proposition, the customer segment. All I'm doing is expanding that a little bit, right? And saying, that the value proposition, let me get my laser pointer. So your value proposition, which is your product or service, 
what what goes into that value proposition features and benefits technology material you're making something or you're creating a service right that's what goes into your value proposition that's the value that is the value that you've created and you're now proposing it to your customer you are proposing this value that's your value proposition and the value proposition is made of pain relievers in other words you're solving this customer over here is solving their problems, their pain points. These pain relievers solve these problems. It's what the customer wants. The first thing the customer wants to know is, this product solves my problems, whatever that problem is, right? I like toothpaste, but I don't want it so, and I want this, whatever the problem is. But this product that you've created should also delight the customer. So you didn't just make a product and say, okay, you wanted us to make a car for you. We've, we've built this car. It has four wheels, a shell, and an engine. It will take you where you need to go. It will solve that problem of transport. You've created a lovely car, right? But this car looks terrible. I, I, I wouldn't be caught dead in it, right? You know, I, I want to look good when I drive it. So I want a car that actually has some aesthetics and even maybe some air condition and a nice stereo and all those. I want to also be delighted. So I want function, but I also want to be, wow, this is so good. This is so great. I want to be delighted as well. So when we design value proposition, when we design products and service, we want to solve problems, pain relievers, but we also want to create gains game creators so to speak we're going to create those as well and that that's when you have a complete package this is what your customer is looking for right they're looking for the whole deal right so okay let me just take off this laser pointer so in essence where does this tie into to marketing when you create your business model canvas which is what takes you forward into business. That's the vehicle, that's the model that takes you into forward into business. It's based on the fundamental relationship between your value proposition and your customer. And this value proposition canvas is simply a little extra information about how to design that relationship between the value proposition, that's what you're going to sell, and the customer. So that's why who have this person who invented, I forget his name now. He's the same person that invented the business model canvas, by the way. This person invented this value proposition canvas to help explain how you create that relationship. So you can use this value proposition to create a theoretical relationship between your value proposition and your customer. Right? Now that's your theory. That's your hypothesis. That's what you think. When you come up with your business idea and you start saying, yeah, and we're going to make this pepper sauce and we're going to put extra shadow berry and I'm going to put a little bit of that and it will look great on this real nice bottle. You start putting in ideas into your head about how this product is going to look because you think that is what the customer wants. In other words, you start formulating a theory and that's good. That's where you start, but don't stop there. That's just your theory. For you to really be successful in business, you have to research your theory. And this is what market research is about. So when someone says, well, you got to do market research, you know. Yeah, but research what and how and where? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What questions are going to ask and to who? Well, you got to start with your theory. Just like any type of research, you have to have a hypothesis. That's the basis for what you're going to investigate. And when you do your business model canvas, you can do a step before you arrive at your final canvas, you can develop a sort of a hypothetical model, especially a hypothetical value proposition canvas, like what I'm showing you here on the screen. That's what this is all about, right? So the business model canvas, which as you see is central to this diagram here. 
it's basically a condensed version of a very detailed business plan. You could make this as detailed as you want. Eh? You could get a 100-page dossier to come up with a business plan. This is now your investment proposal, right? Your investment prospectus, if you want to say. And it has a number of different chapters and sections, including mission statements, SWOT analysis, you know, breakdown of your value proposition, market strategy, et cetera, et cetera. At its core, a business plan has that business model canvas or the, the chapters of a, of a business plan is basically the components of a business model canvas with some added detail left or right. Okay, so it, you, you would have a, like a mission executive summary, then a mission statement, vision statement, SWOT analysis, details of your business canvas, then you would, from your business model canvas, you can derive your financial plan, your financial forecast. You can then extend that into risk analysis and impact analysis. But look over on your right, where it says market research slash stress test. You can't do anything without market research. Your business model canvas, which is your whole plan for going forward with your business idea, depends on that market research. You get that wrong, your business model canvas is misaligned. And if you have a misaligned base canvas, you're in one of the 80%, for sure, All right? You're gonna end up in one of the 80%. So you don't wanna end up in the 80%. What you are doing as students, guys, you are studying marketing. You are studying entrepreneurship. You are learning how to navigate this process structurally from a process perspective. And that by itself is going to put you in the, uh, you know, much closer aligned to being successful. If you apply these principles, you're going to be more aligned to becoming a su successful entrepreneur. If you apply them well, right? So let's talk about what market research is now. Should I pause and take a question or two? Let me check the chat. Renata says, yes, last semester. Was that an old response? I think it might be, and I even forget the question related to that response. But yes, okay, last semester. I think that might have been you were in Natasha's class or you in one of my classes or something like that last semester. Yes, okay, good. Any other questions, guys, with regards to where we are so far? All good. I'm moving with speed because I want to wrap up by seven o'clock. I will offer you guys a five minute break at, seven, at six o'clock. But I will check to see how many people need that break before I give it, right? We have some time still. Okay, let's go. Market research, almost like market research 101 here, right? And you're going to hear me talking about secondary research, primary research. But I also want to encourage you to pay attention to your competitors, competitor analysis. That's part of research. So sometimes when we do research on a product, service, or a business, we focus on the value proposition and the customer. And we want to know how that's going to work out. Yes, you got to do that. But there's a third party in the room, eh? That's sometimes the person we, we have on our blinkers and we forget to pay attention to. That's the man in the other, riding the other horse, running the same race you're running. So open them blinkers a little bit and take a look to see what they're doing because they could catch you on the turn. Okay, so competitor, competitor analysis. Okay, market research basics. It's, it's basically two main broad areas primary research and secondary research, right? Secondary research, I'm gonna go into that. I'll, I have a few slides to cover that. Secondary research is basically research that you can investigate information that is already there. It's online, you could Google it. Um, there's maybe published reports, there's published articles, there's websites, there is statistical information. It's information, it's in the public domain. 
secondary research is information that you can go and access. I'm not saying it's easy to access it, but it's available. It's out there. You can go and investigate and find out and draw, download documents, information, and start formulating a sense of what's happening based on that secondary research. What type of information do you want to gather when you're you know, starting to do a little market survey? I usually start with secondary research as my first port of call. And then I whittle down now to primary research. And I'll come to primary research in a bit. But secondary research is where, as a marketer or a researcher, you'd want to start with. You want to understand the landscape. You want to understand the ecosystem. What are really going on out here? You want to pay attention to what's happening with regards to, um, let's say you, you want to enter into a new part of Trinidad or even a new country with a product. And you don't know if the environment is, you know, appropriate, hostile, conducive, supportive to what you want to sell, the type of persons, type of customers, type of institutions, etc. You want to understand what that environment is like before you go and invest your money and set up shop in Barbados or Guyana, you know, or something like that. Or even in Trinidad, you say, okay, you're going to set up a new business in Tunapuna. You want to understand the layer of the land a little bit first. What's, what's happening in that area? Right? So it's, you can use this diagram. Um, it's a simple diagram that has on the outer edges um, the terms that we refer to as PESO. Um, political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental. There's some a couple others inside there, global forces, etc. But the main type of information, if I wanted to do some market research and I wanted to sort of get a sense of the layer of the land, I would use that acronym PESEL as my sort of guide for what sort of information I would want to know. So I'd want to know what is the political environment and are there any sort of political factors that could be either supportive or harmful or detrimental or negatively affecting the type of business that I want to go into, right? And politics can affect anything, right? It can affect basically um, the culture of, a, of an environment, of a country. It can affect, you know, maybe how laws are made and maybe what type of access different members of the public will have to certain types of goods. Politics could affect that, right? So you want to pay attention to that. And in a lot of countries in the Caribbean, it's not a big factor, but in certain parts of the world, politics can be very, can be a big factor for whether or not you can actually do business in a country. So certain parts of the world are like that. Not so much here. Um, economic would most likely be a big factor for us here in the region um, because economic factors could, could take into consideration things like um, the average you know, level of income, GDP per capita could have a factor of you know, um, you know, what type of spending power you know, persons have in an environment. So the economic factors or the economic landscape could give you a good guide as to whether or not the type of product you plan to, you know, go into the business with. Maybe it's a high quality, high price type of product, but you're trying to sell that in an environment where it's economically depressed. Then you may be misaligned, right? From a sort of a macro perspective. And you could apply the same sort of analytical principles to all the other um, components of that pestle guide. Social, was the social environment like? And that could include culture, how people feel about things generally. Was the societal norms, right, in a, in a, in a country or in a space, right? Um, technological, whether or not there's a very high level of technology adoption, you know, um, you know mobile enabled technology, um, you know, things of that nature could affect whether or not you want to do a business that involves maybe some app or some strong so some strong use of 
website or e-commerce technology. I find, for example, in Trinidad and Tobago, our e-commerce um, options are a little bit on the low side. And many entrepreneurs tell me they, they prefer to operate in the US or in Canada because the e-commerce options are so much wider and easier to access. They can do business so much easier because of the technology adoption and the use of technology in different um, quarters and different aspects of, of you know, business life. Legal and environmental can also play a factor in how your business um, would, would function and what type of consideration, especially environmental these days. Every business that is on the planet right now has to consider their environmental impact and also the current environmental circumstance. So for example, an environment could be anything like the topography, it could be the weather, it could be whether or not you are, uh, you're, you're close to any sort of coastal environment, so, you know? And with these days with climate change and rising sea levels, that's a serious factor to take into consideration, especially a business where you have long-term aspirations, right? So that PESEL acronym, you can use that as your guide to kind of get a good sense of what's happening globally, right? And then you want to drill down the circle in the middle. It's basically a representation of Porter's five forces, right? Doesn't say so, but it's if, if you've ever studied um, Porter and, and the Porter's five forces, he speaks about, you know, some of the key components in an industry sector and some of the factors that drive business success in terms of rivalry and you know some of the competi competition to go after buyers and even suppliers so when you start considering and from a you know macro perspective countrywide drill down one level to industry-wide and see who else is in the industry with you what sort of rivals how well established and strongly competitive are they what is the um, scope for attracting buyers as well as suppliers because everybody's competing for buyers and suppliers, right? And are there the possibility of new entrants coming into the business that could even derail yourself and existing rivals? So you want to sort of pay attention to that. Secondary research gives you this type of information because the information on what I've just described is usually very much available, even if maybe you have to track it down a little bit. There are industry reports, um, and they're usually reports, or at least um, um, online information that you can have access to. I'll say this with a little caveat though. In our part of the world, getting data and getting access to research information that's you know originated in our part of the world is sometimes a little bit tricky, but you just gotta persevere and you gotta, you know dig, dig, dig until you find something. What I advise entrepreneurs to, to do, or sometimes if I'm doing a project on behalf of an entrepreneur, like a business plan, and I don't have enough data on the macro environment or industry environment specific to Trinidad and Tobago, then I use a comparative country, a country where the cultural norms, you know, the population size, the economic status are so similar that I can extrapolate that in this environment, in Singapore, with only 3 million people, they've been able to achieve X, Y, Z, and our having similar type of cultural norms, et cetera, et cetera. We believe that you know, if we were to implement this type of idea, it would have the same degree of attractiveness. So I extrapolate. And that's one technique that you can use in conducting secondary market research. Okay, guys? Where do you get sources of information for secondary market research? I just have a list here. Newspaper, news reports, statistical reports, economic performance reports, social indicators, population statistics, etc. Government policy documents, websites, and also, as I just lastly mentioned, reports from similar profiled countries, countries with a kind of similar profile to ours. Um, us in the region, uh, probably a similar country to the Caribbean countries that you could probably get good data on that you could use to help you. Maybe Costa Rica, Panama, I find is pretty useful to get some uh, some similarities there. It's, it's close enough and there's similar sort of, you know, cultural nuances. 
um, you know, lifestyle, lifestyle habits, etc. Even though they are different language, there's there similarities that can apply. So, and they usually have much better data than ours, right? So you can you can do that as well. Okay. All right. Now, before I go into primary research, let me pause and take a question or two on what I just spoke about with regards to secondary research. As a matter of fact, I'll even pause for, I'll give you guys three minutes. If anybody needs to run quick, go to the bathroom, get some coffee. And I'll just take some questions by the time. So let's pause for three minutes. I have on my clock, I have four minutes to six. So we start back promptly at six o'clock. In the meantime, if anyone has a question, you can ask it. You could type it in the chat. You can even put a comment. That's also fine. Yes, Dr. Pacheco, absolutely right. CSO data. It's almost like every time I hear the word CSO data, I have to chuckle a little bit because it's 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 often very dated, very dated. So the reality of data analysis in our part of the world, guys, is it's very slim pickings. Primary research is your best bet. And we need to start building um, a very solid bank of data. Data is what drives strategy. Data is what drives innovation. Data is what drives economic development, right? Um, information is the new oil, right? And we sometimes forget to um, pay attention to that. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you why data is so hard to sort of compile in one place. It's because different entities have different forms of reporting, data gathering. They even use different software, different platforms, and very often they're not interoperable. So to try and compile in one place all the data on the agriculture sector for production of something, or all the data on you know, manufacturing sector on XYZ. Every entity is doing their own thing in terms of reporting, in terms of the type of software platform and accounting package that they use, and they're not interoperable. So that's one thing. But even at the public sector and government services level, even within those different divisions, there is not enough interoperability of, of data. They, typically operate, you know, not using the same platform in a lot of cases. I think there's a lot of work to try and improve that, no doubt, right? But I don't think we fully there as yet. And there's still a lot of um a lot of work to be done. There was one um there was one uh group within the university here that invented well let me retract that statement. They did invent but they they came up with a new methodology for doing fingerprint um, recognition, a new technology for fingerprint recognition. And um, fingerprint recognition is not new. You have facial recognition, palm and finger, et cetera, et cetera, right? It basically read your fingerprint. But this group on campus figured out how to do this in a unique way, so much so that the university patented that technology. So they have, there is now in existence patented technology for fingerprint recognition, biometrics recognition, right? So one of the things that myself and a team working with me did was present a pitch to the government a couple of years ago 
to implement fingerprint recognition technology in the government service that would facilitate interoperability of the different platforms, et cetera, because through fingerprint technology, you can avoid things such as ID cards and driver's permits and passports and people who don't have a passport from coming in from different countries, um, maybe refugees or things like that. And the use of fingerprint technology could allow, let's say, some government sector involved in social and community, you know, services, you know, there's different services, right? It's a, it's a, it's a tricky area to, to support. And there's been a lot of, um, a lot of inconsistency and a lot of um, evidence of fraud, right? People throwing up and, you know, asking for check payouts for their grandfather, grandfather dead years ago. And they're still hoping for that check payout and they come in with the, the ID. But fingerprint technology can, can eliminate a lot of the risks and can facilitate a sort of a interoperability of different service platforms. And so we presented that argument to Minister West um, some couple of years ago. And it was, you know, it was well received. Um, you know, the only reason it didn't go forward is because there's a lot of work behind the scene that I think even the government has to do to even set that process up in their various agencies and, and institutions. But many parts of the world, they're solving the problem of data by implementing biometrics technology, India, different parts of the world, et cetera. They implement a lot of this technology because they know a large percentage of their population do always have their documents in order. And um, statistics, CSO, is based on data on, on the population of Trinidad and Tobago and businesses in Trinidad and Tobago, and it's a broad spectrum. And sometimes data is hard to get simply because, you know, the person who has to supply the data don't have their right documents or they even try and fraud. So there's different ways in which we could come up with some solutions and um, that might have been one if we could kind of make the leap towards putting those things in place. Anyway, so it's now two minutes past six. So I think we should start back and hopefully everyone who needed to just take a quick break were able to do so. Who need to grab a quick cup of tea or cup of coffee or whatever. You got that and you're ready to roll again. So primary rock market research. This is this is the bread and butter of a marketer, or at least one one aspect of of a marketer. It's um, you gotta have the communication and the promotion and the you know market entry strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's one side of it, but it's the fundamental components of um, marketing is getting information about the target customer segment. And um, you have to, in most cases, go straight to the, you know, the people, go straight to the segment and ask. It's, you're not going to get enough information just by doing secondary research. You're just going to get broad information. And that's not going to allow you to come up with a strategy. In order to come up with a strategy, you have to have refined information about who this customer is and what type of behavior and choices they would typically make. And so that's what we want to do. So if you look at this slide, let me get my laser pointer up and running. If you look at this slide, you'll see on one side, I have some information about target customer. And the other, the other side, I have some information about a product or service, product or service design. And this kind of is reminiscent of the um, value proposition canvas, as you may recall, that I um, showed you a couple slides a while back. Let's just get rid of this laser pointer. Wow, can't turn off the laser pointer. One second, guys. Ah, praise the Lord. Yeah. 
it's kind of reminiscent of the value proposition canvas, which is on one side, you have your value proposition and on the other side, you have your target customer segment. That's what this diagram tries to represent. And imagine that your value proposition canvas is your theory, your hypothesis, and you need to now investigate. Well, what I've listed for you here is the type of information you would want to investigate. So with regards to the customer, the customer profile, if you look at the little diagram, top right corner of the customer segment, it almost, almost looks like a target with a person's face right in the middle. Well, that person is basically representative of your ideal customer. This is the one that you're trying to sell to. And you're, you're trying to sell to others like this person. Let me help. There may be hundreds, there may be thousands like this person in terms of profile. Now, that's not to say when you come up with a product or service to sell, others on that target face are not interested completely in this product. Here. They may be, but to a lesser and lesser extent, the, you know, the broader you go. And it's because the more accurate and the more closer you are aligned between your product and your customer segment, you're going to find that you're zeroing closer and closer to exactly who you're trying to sell your product to. And you can, you know, categorize persons based on things like age, gender, income bracket, educational level, geographic residence. You could go on, right? There's so many different ways you can categorize and profile somebody. And whether you think it's a good thing or not to do, profiling your customer base gives you a kind of a sense of, well, a person who fits this age bracket or persons of this gender or persons of this income bracket typically make these type of buyer choices. And, you know, it's, it's simply because, you know, persons of a certain age would buy certain things or behave in a certain way. So, for example, I am of a certain age and I might find that I use Facebook more often than something like Instagram. My little niece, who's a lot younger than me, she don't even use Facebook. She's just on Instagram all the time because that's where her friends and her network is. Right? And my, for example, my dad, who is a lot older than me, he don't even understand any of the above. He buying a Guardian or Express if he wants to get information. He don't even use social media. He don't even know where he's at, right? So he has to literally buy a physical paper with, with actual paper to turn pages to get information. And that's the age bracket. That is pure and simple, just the age bracket because we come from different generations and we've learned to live in the world and we've learned to experience the world in a certain way, right? And we stick with that. We might learn and we might adapt, right? But more or less, we have we have become, you know, acculturized to function in a certain way. So demographic factors can play a role in how your target customers will think and behave when they, you know, looking to make a, a, a buyer choice. Psychographic and cultural factors just below will also play a role there lifestyle and beliefs. I might be very pro-environment, you know, and I am very conscious about buying products that are environmentally friendly, recyclable packaging, etc., etc. Or I may not. My lifestyle and my beliefs might simply say, heck, I just want good price and good value for money. I don't care about the environment. Just make sure it's affordable. And who's to say right or wrong, right? I might be have, you know, because of my experiences, developed a certain lifestyle and belief system um, that could apply to how I make decisions when I make a purchase. Political opinion could affect that. Cultural identification. How do I identify as a person, as an individual living in Trinidad and Tobago? Could affect the type of things I buy, the type of music that I listen to, the type of places that I go. Right. And we are all like that as human beings. We are living in the world. We are experiencing the world. And 
based on our experiences, we tend to buy choices, listen to music, you know, do things that are, you know, related to how we feel most comfortable. So this is why customer profiling or targeting customers based on your analysis of who they are and what type of person they are will help you as a marketer. Because once you understand who your customers are, you now know who to communicate to, what you should communicate, what type of words you should use that would be acceptable or not acceptable, what type of images you should use that would be considered acceptable or not acceptable, what type of features or you know benefits within your product or service would be considered by this customer as good or bad, right? So the design of your entire value proposition really hinges upon who you're trying to sell this product to. And if you look over to the left, when we start considering the design of your product, you guys who are in the boot camp, you have to design a product. You may not necessarily have to physically make it and bring it on display, but certainly when you do your pitch presentation in a couple of weeks to try to win the prize, your judge is going to want to understand, well, who you're selling this to, and please describe the design of this product or service. And that includes, as you see, number one, the process design. Maybe there's, maybe your service has some process components in it. Maybe you have a product where the, there's some sort of, you know, delivery process, right? So that could affect, you know, whether or not the customers like it or not. The technology behind it, whether it's new or adaptive or adopted technology, what technology is underlying this product or service, type of material you use, craftsmanship, the aesthetics, Remember the example of the car, I want the car to look nice while I'm driving it. Distribution strategy, in other words, where do you place this product could affect whether or not I like it or not. If you have a great product and it's not well placed, maybe you don't have it online in a shopping a platform, I might buy it. Because I might not be the one to just go and walk around for hours in the mall. I prefer to shop online. So you got to think of that and think of your profile of customers. Marketing strategy. How do you communicate? What do you communicate? What do you say? When do you say it? Why do you say it? All of those things will affect whether or not I am gravitating to your product, I like your product, or I make a, the active choice to buy it. So market research, primary market research is about trying to find out these things that you see on the screen. You're trying to get a good sense, an accurate understanding of how to design your product or service and who you should be targeting. So now that we've discussed that, let's discuss how you'd actually gather information to try and figure these things out. W what steps can you use? Okay, do I need to pause for a question or two? Alia says, how do you deal with marketing the same products and services to target market mix of mixed multiple demographics? Okay, interesting question. So you have the same product or service, but you're trying to target a kind of a mixed bag of customers. Is that correct? Different backgrounds, etc. Right, okay. Well, one answer Alia and others in the room is, that's a tricky prospect to try to pull off, to try to come up with a product or service that everybody would love. And this is what I say to entrepreneurs all the time. Eh? We naturally assume that everybody would love our product, all backgrounds, all you know, cultures, all educational levels. And for some products, that's true. For some products, that is true, right? Everybody would like it especially food products where it's, you know, it's like a basic, you have to have it. Bread, everybody eats bread. But even within bread, there are some customers who will only eat whole wheat, whole grain, multigrain, white bread, sliced bread, buns, rolls. Some customers, even within the, you know, the, the broad umbrella of bread, 
you can break that down to into sort of different different divisions, right? So my my advice on at one level is try to really understand is there the potential for a specific niche market who feel a little bit more strongly than the rest about your product. You're trying to identify that group because that group are like the first market movers. They're the ones that would respond first. The minute you put up your hand and you say, I have this bread, it's all organic, made of multigrain with nuts. There's a group outside there that was waiting for that. And as soon as you say that's available, they're the first to respond. That's not to say the others won't buy it. Now, how do you market this product? In my strategy, I would try to figure out, well, what's the profile of the person who would respond first and create marketing content that speaks to that person first, but have enough sort of broadness in my marketing strategy, not too much, but enough broadness to sort of invite others into you know, the product as well. It's a little tricky, but I think if you try to market something to too broad a spectrum of customers, what you'll essentially be doing is sending out a scattershot and hoping for the best. And scattershot approaches to marketing usually don't work very well because your audience is confused as to who is this message for? They're using a style of language that, I mean, I wouldn't write it off completely, but they're really speaking to me. They're using imagery and content that I wouldn't really write it off, but I, you know, I would have preferred they did this. You're a little bit too broad, you know? So every product, if, you know, if you design it well, does have a sort of a core niche customer that you want to try and identify. And this is what market research is all about. You're trying to see if you can find that person in the middle of the target board there and then speak directly to that person. That person is the first market, first time, move on the product, there will be followers who will come behind and follow as well. But I think it will be a more effective if you target that person specifically. Okay? Okay. All right, let's move on. Market research. I kind of put a step-by-step -step process to how you do market research, especially for you guys in the bootcamp class who who have to do market research as a prerequisite to designing your, your value proposition to do your pitch. And I'll just run through it very quickly, step by step. It's a process. You can follow this, these steps and come out with some fairly decent market information. You gotta first start with your assumptions. Do you guys remember what the assumptions were? What's your main assumption? I used the word hypothesis when I spoke about a few slides ago. What's the underlying basis for doing market research? You came up with something. It's actually in italics right underneath the number one there. Value proposition. Thank you, Teddy Ann. Thank you very much. Yes, your value proposition, canvas. That's basically what you think. That's what you came up with. When you first came up with that idea, you made a sample bottle, you feel it tastes good, and then you figured this is how you're going to create this bottle of pepper sauce. You're going to put extra shadow benny, and you're going to put little chunks of, I don't know, something in it, pop or something like that, people's put up, right? To make it give it that nice richness, right? Because that's what you think customers want. They want extra shadow benny with chunks of pop or floating around in it, right? In your mind, that's a great idea. And you therefore think everybody would like that too. What you don't know is not everybody will like it. And now you have to figure out, well, who would like that product, right? Which type of person? And it doesn't have to be a specific person. It could be a specific type of restaurant or a specific type of business if you're going B2B as well. So you're going to try to figure out that. But number one is come up with your hypothesis. Come up with your theory. Make that sample. Decide that this is what you want to now test. 
effective marketers, when they come up with product, they actually make about two or three or even four different samples. And they test all and see which one comes out on top. So you can test one, but you can also make four or five different samples, recipes, formulations, and market test all. Each one becomes your little value proposition canvas, right? Next thing you want to do is to establish a methodology for conducting your research. I'm going to come to that. That's the next slide. But you, you have to decide how are you going to gather information? But the first thing you want to do is do your assumption first, which is your value proposition canvas. Then figure out, okay, I'm going to use this method to test this theory. And assuming you have executed your method, you would have gathered information, right? So you execute it. Yes. Somebody yeah, sorry, that was an accident. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. No problems. That's all right. Yeah. So assuming you did execute some form of market research method and you started getting results, you want to know analyze that results. Especially with market research, you could get all sorts of results. Eh? Different types of research will give you results that are very quantitative, and some types of results could be almost like written, qualitative type of you know feedback, viewpoints, opinions. And if you get a lot of viewpoints and opinions, you now have to sort of synthesize or configure those viewpoints and opinions into something that you can now do something with. If you got a lot of quantitative results, like you did a survey questionnaire and you got yes, no answers or scale of one to five answers and you could number everything, then you could get more sort of statistical, you know, easy to quantify, so to speak, type of data results. But that doesn't, that doesn't stop there. That's just the results that you've managed to synthesize and you've managed to, you know, collate. You now have to interpret those results. Those results mean something. So when your result says 15% of responders chose this and 75% of the responders selected four to five for this, that's the data. It means something. You have to interpret it. You have to say, what does that result now mean? Having interpreted the results and forming some conclusions in your mind as to what it means, only then are you now ready to build out your business model canvas. Because your business model canvas is basically a little mini strategy. Eh? It's a strategic plan. It is a description of what you're going to sell, what value you're offering, who you're going to sell it to, how you will market and promote it, which distribution channels you're going to use, what critical activities you will need to engage to deliver that value, what resources you will need to drive that activity that delivers the value, whether or not you would use certain key partners or strategic partner or maybe a tactical partner. And all of those things result in a cost and a revenue stream that you can compare with each other to see if the overall plan is viable. Okay? But that business model canvas or that strategy, same thing, that strategy, it's based on your interpretation of the results of the research that you did where you followed a certain methodology, beginning, of course, with a hypothesis. That's how you conduct market research. You follow that type of process. Okay? So what are the different methodologies that you can use? They're not that hard, right? Market research is more sort of, you have to do the work. It's not rocket science to actually get to the point where you have the data. You, interpreting the data becomes a little tricky depending on what type of data you got. But there are three simple methodologies that you can use. Those of you in the bootcamp class or even those of you in the marketing class who may have a coursework assignment, right? Um, these are some strategies that you can use or some techniques that you can use. One is an online survey. It's like a poll. I'm sure all of you have gone to Google surveys or Google Forms and created a little poll and you send that out on WhatsApp or to maybe social media and you start gathering some feedback on it, right? 
That's actually fairly simple to do. The key to doing that is design your question on a little um, Word document first, design what you want to ask, and then put it on your um, Google Forms and design the type of responses you expect to get as well. That's a, that's a tricky part as well. When you design a survey questionnaire, you have to have the foresight to understand what type of response should you expect. Should you expect a yes, no response for this question? Should you expect a maybe, um, okay, how much would you like this feature if we were to implement it on a scale of one to 10? Then that type of response will allow you to sort of gauge not, with, not only whether or not the person likes the feature, but how much they like the feature. So you're actually getting two types of information for that question. One, the person is leaning towards the like or the yes, but you're also getting information on the degree, how strongly they like. And that in itself is good information to know, right? So online surveys really allows you to create a questionnaire, put it on a standard, you know, digital form on an electric, electronic form and circulate that to uh, a broad cross-section of a large population, right? Here's so many tricks to coming up with a good online survey. Break up your survey into three sections. One section should cover a little bit about your customer profile, who they are, what type of person, like age, gender, um, maybe income bracket, not income. You should not ask questions on a survey where it, it becomes personal. Like, what do you want to know that for, boy? Why is this person asking me this? Nah, I ain't doing that survey. And that's the end of your survey. So when you're asking profile questions, don't push it. Just ask just what you need. Okay, that's as a, as a rule of thumb. So that section, that might be your first section where you're trying to find out about this person. The second section that you want to kind of use in your survey questionnaire would be questions related to your theory, your value proposition theory. It's related to the features and benefits that you are offering, and you want to see how much they like this feature on a scale of one to five, on a scale of one to 10. How important is this? How much do you like this? How does this compare relative to? You're trying to get some quantifiable results that allows you to sort of almost like statistically analyze the, the, the feedback, the views of the responders. Now, the key to this is when you can see how much a person likes a feature, you can also correlate that person's response with the type of profile that responded. So now you can see, yes, this person responded very positively to this feature. And look, this is, happens to be a female age 35 to 50 at this income bracket. You might even discover that that seems to be typical for that profile of person. And then that helps you to now zero in on a, a, a closer understanding of who your target market should be relative to that feature. So online service does allow you to do that if you kind of build it out properly. The last section, and that shouldn't be a long section, at least the way I do it, is a more like a, I usually ask one question or two questions where I ask the person, give me a suggestion. Give me an opinion on what else should we include? What features don't you like, you know, that we should take into consideration? So that's how I break up my um, survey questionnaire. The second way you can gather information about your theory is you can do a focus group. You can gather six, seven, eight, maybe up to nine persons in a room, make sure that they are comfortable and ask them questions about the product or service and the features and potential benefits, et cetera, et cetera. You can even have comparable products to compare and see how they feel about that. Usually a good way to do that is not disclose the brands of the comparable products and just get an objective opinion. And you can have a discussion around that. The key to focus groups as opposed to online surveys is with a focus group, you choose who comes in your room. You decide, I want this type of person to talk to. 
because I feel that this type of person who is in this industry or in this sector or at this level of education is going to be most knowledgeable and therefore I'm going to have a rich conversation about the product and I'm going to really get some good intelligence. With our online survey, you don't choose. As a matter of fact, you make it as random as possible. You create your survey and you circulate that in as a random way as possible. You learn to do that when you start doing research. But the more random, the better you are able to get data that you can now start analyzing in a, in a, in a really structured way. So focus groups is where you have persons in a room and you encourage conversation. You ask questions, making sure everybody has an opportunity to answer, etc. Usually, if you're gonna do a focus group and it's your product, you may not want to be the person doing the interview. You may want to have someone else doing that because if somebody starts rambling about how bad the product is, you may lose your cool and all of a sudden there's a different type of conversation taking place in the room. So usually with focus groups, there's somebody who's a moderator does that focus group. I've done it before, right? Lastly, you can do just one-on-one -on -one interviews. This is like a key informant, somebody who is knowledgeable about the product or the industry or the sector that you want to get into. And that person, if they're really knowledgeable, can give you good insight, good information about your product design, the typical customers, um, you know, the potential competitors, possibly even strategy that you could think of. Um, so sometimes interviewing somebody one-on-one -on -one really does give you good information. But again, just like focus groups, you gotta choose this person. This is not like a random person off the street. This is somebody who you know is able to give you really rich, good information about the type of product or service that you wanna do. So there's three different methods. I've, in some of the classes that I lecture in with um, Dr. Amkisun, we have students who work in groups and they decide to use multiple uh, methods because they wanted to get that level of detail. They wanted to do the online survey and they also wanted to do interviews. And we says, yes, go ahead and do it. And they got good information. That's not to say you have to do, you know, two or three. You can choose one method for your research and get good information. It's what you do with the information, how you interpret it and analyze it and come up with a strategy. That's what is, that's what's important, All right? Okay. This slide simply describes what I just described earlier in terms of what sort of questions to ask. You wanna sort of ask profile questions, age, gender, location, income bracket, lifestyle, et cetera. Notice for location, I didn't say address. Location could just be north, south, east, west, Tobago, something like that, right? Um, again, be careful about invasive, inappropriate, or personalized questions. The same thing will apply in a one-on-one -on -one interview, right? Um, always think of the other person whenever you're doing research. Always, always think of the other person, okay? Um, Feature and preferences questions, that's basically your theory. That's your hypothesis. And of course, analyzing the results and interpreting the results. That's the key to forming your business model canvas slash strategy. Okay, let me pause before I go into the next slide. This one is kind of important, this next slide. But let me pause a little bit. Anybody has questions so far? We all good? I have a question. Hmm? I wanted to know whether a key informant could be considered a renowned, like a renowned um, author from a book. So it's, it's not actually a person, but it's actually a book. You look to uh, information or a website, for example, or even, sorry, an organization like PAHO. Mm -hmm. So please, can you let me know if a key informant has to be a person? Is it limited to just being a person? Yeah, well, if you did that, right, you reviewed like a book or something like that or some prior literature, that would be secondary research, right? You are actually, what you're doing there, Dahlia, is you, you haven't spoken to, to somebody individually. You've done secondary research, which is great. And you will get good information if you chose the right literature, the right book, or, you know, the right source material. Yeah. 
from a strategic perspective, you'll get good secondary information. But if you want to, you know, get deeper insight, you, you can't beat getting a key informant who is actually a person, a human being, right? Now, these days and in future, things will get a little bit funny and dicey because sometimes AI will, at some point, AI technology will kick in and you could be sitting down talking to somebody on Zoom, not knowing if that is a real person on the other side of that camera. And I'll tell you, the other day I was at a, I was at a pitch competition, right? I was up by UTC. I managed a program for them. And one of the candidates presented a pitch for an app. And um, she says, okay, I just need to just play um, this first component of the pitch. Um, and we have a presenter doing this part. And she opened up the screen and we were all in the boardroom and this person came up on the screen and started to do the first component of the pitch for about for two or three minutes, right? I said, that was really good, really good. But I was wondering why she was speaking in an American accent. Because I thought it was, you know, for only local entrepreneurs. So I asked her that. You know, that, you know, that was a good um, pitch. Thank you very much for that. Um, is that person based in Trinidad? Me with my foolish self asking the question. And then she smiled and said, that wasn't a person. That was an AI. And so, and, and literally, we in the room almost couldn't tell the difference, right? The only, I mean, it's, it's, the technology is getting so good these days that you really have to look and see maybe the person doesn't have like human nuances and hand movements and things like that, but they, they put in all of that into it. So research is gonna get interesting in future. Right, it it is going to get interesting, and when you think you're doing a one on one interview, you might have to have in your um letter of request, please indicate whether or not you are a human being. That may have to go into your um interview letter. Please indicate or declare that you are not a robot before we conduct this interview. Right, Doctor Pacheco, that might happen. Who knows? Actually, okay. just, just, just to interject here, um, one of the interesting things is I recently um, submitted a paper to, to a journal for publication. And one of the new things that they're asking for now is that you certify that none of this work was prepared by an AI, which has ne I've never encountered that before. I mean, usually they assume it's people sending in stuff. That's right. And now they're asking, before they publish anything, they're asking certify and, and you know actually tick a box to certify it was not done by an AI because they recognize that people are actually using AI to replace yeah. people. Um, so it's gotten to that point now that you don't trust that it's people anymore. You actually have to certify that now. Yep, you have to declare you are alive and a human being. That's um, correct. You know, and that's the beginning, eh? it's gonna get more. So that's just the world we are heading into. Um, but we as human beings will adapt and we will put mechanisms to ensure that hopefully all is well, right? We hope. But anyway, so let's move on. So what I wanted to talk about is having gathered market research, having gathered market intelligence about what customers like, what are their preferences, what they how they feel about your packaging, the the price, the design features, the product placement, where you distribute it to, and where they can access it, how they feel about those things. Those that information resolves itself into, you know, an analysis report that you do, right? Whether it is formal or it's just informal, but you have now data at your disposal. Okay. Now, within that set of data you can pick out what is most important to your profile of customers. What, see, what features have emerged as most important? So if you look at the, the sort of the red circle highlighting that set of data, this is 
typically, if I get some data from our research, I might be able to rank features in terms of importance. I might be able to identify which features are most important, which seem to be getting the highest scores, in other words, et cetera. And let's say it was a food product. If you look at the table down below, I might have figured out that the most important features are taste, appearance, shelf life, minimal additives, and price. Let's say I did that, right? Because that's what emerged. Now, at one level, I now know what features my customers are looking for as most important in a brand. So I know they're looking for taste as the number one feature. I know they're looking for appearance as the number two feature, et cetera, et cetera. So I can build a product simply just doing that, okay? But I can also use that information to do some competitor analysis because I can compare my products, taste, appearance, shelf life, minimum additives, and price. I can compare those features with that of my competitors to see where my strengths and weaknesses are and then make even further refinements to my product. Maybe accentuate the appearance a little bit, maybe because I'm losing marks on that. Accentuate the shelf life a little bit because I'm losing marks on that. So if you look, notice in this table, the way it's designed, you have brand one, brand two, brand three, brand four, and then I have your brand or my brand, right? And the way I would do it is get information about how customers feel, not just in generally about what they like and do like enough product features, but how does my product compare to the others? And the way I would do that typically is a focus group. I can't do that with a um, questionnaire survey or one-on-one -on -one interview. If I do, and I've done it with a focus group where we've had different brands in the room, not labeled so that the, the responders did not know which brand was which, and then ask them to compare each brand in terms of taste, appearance. Well, in this case, we have shelf life, obviously they couldn't do that for that test, but other things. So we, we looked at the main features of the brand that we were testing and we were able to compare how the main brand, which was my client's brand, compared to the competitor's brand. And based on that outcome, I now have additional information that allowed me to further tweak or provide advice to further tweak this brand to bring out certain features or to strengthen certain features even further. So just knowing that customers like taste Customers like appearance, they prefer a long shelf life. Just knowing that is one level of information. That's the most basic information that you want to find out when you do research. You want to know that. That's, that's like level one. You want to know that information. And if you did that, you'd be on the right track. If you really want to stand out in business, you want to know, take those same features that customers have identified as important, and compare how does that stack up against the competitors, All right? And I'll give you another example. There's a, um, one of the UE um, professors developed a new product right here on campus. And they came up with some really good design features for their product, right? And they've, they, they had some interaction with customers at a certain level, and they figured out that customers like these things, X, Y, Z. And they were ready to now go launch this business product and start selling it. And um, I was asked to give some advice and some opinion on this. And the first question that came to my mind was, okay, that looks good. How does it compare with the competitors? And then the professor kind of paused. And I realized he paused. I say, but did we do competitor analysis? Did we compare our product with the three or four main competitor brands? And they had not done that. 
And so they were about to launch this product, go all gung ho, thinking that because customers like these features, that would be the be all and then end all. But customers may like those features and can get it in another product. You know. Doesn't mean that they will buy yours. All it means is they like those features. You have to see how your brand of features compares with the competitors in terms of strengths, intensity. How much shelf life does yours give? How much appearance does yours give? How much flavor does yours give compared to the competitors? So just knowing that the customers like those things is not enough. That's just level one. Level two is comparing that now with competitors. And that's why I came, did this little table here to give you a kind of idea of what type of analysis to do, how to design a little competitor analysis table. And the way you would do that is, a good way to do it is focus groups, where you invite persons to really have the conversation very open and frankly about your product and how it compares to the two or three other main competitor products. It gives you good insight and it gives you now information to go back to the drawing board with your product and refine it even further. So that's all this does, okay? And, um, you know, sometimes when you did that, you realize that your product either scores well or doesn't score so well when compared to competitors. Another layer to that, and I don't want to go too much on because then it becomes real technical now. You could even take those same features, taste, appearance, shelf life, minimal additives, et cetera, and you can weight it. So we know that customers like those features. What weight do customers place for each feature? And does the weighting of each feature affect the outcome, right? No, I'm mentioning it so that you are aware that there's another level that you can go to. And um, if anybody, you know, is ever interested in going to that level of research, you know, I can help and provide some guidance on that. I even use my own Excel with some formula that allows you to calibrate based on weight, um, how your brand will come out relative to a competitor's brand. The key thing, however, is knowing the weight to put. And even that requires some market research because you have to get that information from customers. So not only the customer says, I like taste, what weight would you ascribe to taste? I put 5% just out of, you know, just to make it obvious, but you could weight different things and see how the outcome turns out, okay? Last slide. We do have a couple other slides, but I think I can pause and take some questions after this one. This diagram is basically just sort of highlighting the sequence of work or marketing research that you would do to arrive at your business model canvas or your strategy. So over on the left, way on the left there, you see that little, little diagram that looks like a business, like a value proposition canvas? Well, that's a value proposition canvas. So that's your theory. Remember that your value proposition canvas, your first draft of it, that's your theory. That's what you think, right? You came up with that idea. You made up a, a minimal prototype and you came up with some gains and pains. That's your theory. The arrow points towards somebody doing an interview. That's the market research. In this case, this looks like a one-on-one -on -one interview, right? So you're doing an interview to get a stronger sense and validation of your value proposition canvas. In other words, validate your theory, either reject or accept or make modifications to your value proposition, right? Having done the research, you are now ready to refine your value proposition. So that's where you see the little picture of the, the little hand showing a gift, right? With the diamond inside. That's now, this is the polished value proposition. It's now ready. It's been thoroughly researched and tested. And now you are ready to put that value proposition into your business model canvas. And that's what's over on the right. And that's now your strategy. This is what you will now do to set up this business. Having done all of the work, the theorizing, the research, and refining your value proposition, 
Now you have a business model that is workable. That's what the judges slash investors want to know. They want to know your business model canvas. In other words, they want to know your strategy. They also want to understand how you arrived at that strategy. So you will be able to explain that work. Those of you who are marketers, this is the context behind marketing. Marketing, whether you're marketing for a company, a startup company, a business, an enterprise, an organization, every organization, every business, every entity on the planet that offers something for sale, offers a service, you can actually create a business model for that. That's very similar to the one there. And any business model, any strategy is based upon your creation of value, your offer of value, whether that is a service, it could be a banking service, a government service, an educational service. It could be a product, it could be pepper sauce, it could be books, it could be a new car, it could be anything. Your value proposition, it could be a product or service, anything that is value, it is of value. It's only implementable value if you can place it in a commercial setting, place it within an organization or place it within a business where that business has different components to it. So, um, yep, question? I heard, a, I heard a hand go up or a mic come on. Okay, you you could come back to that question in a little bit. Let me just wrap up. Let me just wrap up. So there's a sort of a sequence. There's a sort of a logical sequence to planning. You know, market research and marketing is is about executing a good plan. And there's a sort of there's a certain sense of logic and sequence that goes into it, right? Um, I do have a few more slides on marketing development and promotional strategy i'll just skim through those things very quickly because that would be those would be elements that you would get very strongly in your current class um for the benefit of the um bootcamp class you wouldn't be called upon to actually do any promotion but you would want to describe what your promotional strategy would be and in marketing and promotion the fundamentals of promotion is understanding your, your four P's, your price, product, place, promotion, right? So basically what you are going to be modifying or presenting as value is basically price, whether it is affordable, whether it is appropriately priced. You could even have a high price and that's more attractive than a lower price for certain types of products. Eh? If I get us... You know, if I buy a product that is the price too low, I may have a perception of low quality and low value, and I may not want it. If the price is more appropriate, even if it's higher, I may get a sense of, you know, feeling like it has more appropriate value for me. And again, profiling your customer will help you to figure that out. The product itself, the variety, the differentiation, in other words, the features that goes into it, um, whether you not use a that, that low-cost strategy should be a pricing strategy, right? But your product itself, in the design of the product or service, could, you know, be a factor in how you market and promote. Placement, communication of where to access, um, point of sale, you know, um, distribution. How does one get in touch with this product? And, of course, your promotion is basically your what sort of brand identity you're trying to build. You know, what sort of advertising strategy? Where do you not tell you do any sort of two for one promotions or anything like that? There's a number of different strategies. So price, product, place, and promotion is really the fundamentals of um marketing advertising strategy. It sort of follows those lines. Right? Other forms of marketing that people sometimes don't take into consideration is like um, attending trade shows and conferences like the TIC that was um, in June, July of this year is a good one to attend. Um, the UE Netco Bootcamp and the, the, the um, Associated Business Expo that we're going to have in November. Um, that should be being marketed very soon. If you are an entrepreneur, 
either in the network boot camp or you are in uh, Natasha's class or Dr. Pacheco's class, you may be an entrepreneur and you may want to showcase some of your goods at the expo, which is scheduled, I think, for the 21st of November. Um, some of my team at Entrepreneurship Unique are going to be promoting that soon. And they're going to try to do that in the undercroft, right? But those types of things allow you to pro promote and market and network. Um, knowing your brand and knowing your brand philosophy and how you want to position your product is really, really important so that you communicate the right message. Not knowing your brand and understanding what you stand for and what's your philosophy could result in you communicating a sort of a confusing message that, you know, your customers aren't too clear about. And also building your brand identity also requires you to sort of really understand your customers as well so that you build that relationship that someone asked about earlier in this session. You know, how do you build a relationship? It really starts with communication and communicate what? Well, communicate, well, your, your brand features, your value features, but also your philosophy, your identity. What, what, what do you stand for as a company and as a brand? Sometimes that is also very important for the customer to know. If you are producing a product that is really, really good, but you have a bad philosophy, you treat your employees bad, you don't care about the environment, then certain customers will not go for that brand. No matter how good a quality the brand is itself, the, the, the product is itself. Right? So your brand identity really does play a big part in how people perceive the value of your product and service. Digital media is a big part of uh, marketing and promoting, promoting these days. I mean, since the early 2000s, that's become like the forefront of marketing strategy. You know, where do you place information? Even e-commerce and selling products takes place online. So um, digital media and digital marketing is really key. And understanding that as a strategy is also very important. It boils down to the fundamentals, communication. What do you say, where you say, and how you say it? Understanding who your customer profile is, it boils down that, to that as well, right? If you understand those things, you will be able to communicate the right message in the right place in social media. Social media is just a platform. It's just a space where information can be accessed. That's all it is, right? But you still have to know what to say, where to say, and how to say it. Okay. All right. Those are my slides. I'll stop there now and take some questions. And or in, and or any comments. Everybody's okay? It looks like you, you may not be getting any comments. So I, I'm yeah. just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna make a comment here in terms of the um focus of what you did there. I just wanna, you know, thank right. you for packaging that in terms of the focus of the consumer um and the customer focus that you had with the presentation in terms of ensuring that you understand that customer in a very deep way. And that is a foundation of everything that you know it, we, we do in marketing. It all goes back to that customer understanding. You know, all the research and everything is really getting in in touch with your consumer in a deep way, having that relationship, understanding, so that you can better serve them. So, I, I just want to thank you for reinforcing that point because I always talk about the three C's. You know, the company, the customer, and then the competitors, and having those all three in play. Um, so that focus on the customer. I think was very helpful to sort of ensure that we take that as a key takeaway from the from the session this evening. Excellent. I'm glad. I see Apana. I hope I pronounced that name properly, Apana. Will the slides be available to us? Yeah. Um, I usually make my slides, I put them in um, PDF and then they they usually go into your my learning. I'll just um um Dr. Pacheco through Joel, who you know. Um, I will send the slides him, and um, he can um, help sort that out on your side. Absolutely, I'll put it on the my learning site as soon as I get it. So thank you very much for sharing it. 
Okay, cool. All right, guys. All right. Well, thank you again. I certainly want to express our appreciation for you sharing what you did this evening with, with, the, with the class and all of us. I think it was very informative, very insightful. And I hope that everyone who participated in today's session walks away with at least one nugget of information that lets them up their game, their marketing game as they go forward. And hopefully there are some entrepreneurs among the group here who might be paying you a visit in the near term. You might want to just share where you're located if they want to have a chat with you about maybe their own business, something they're interested in doing. The yeah. Where's the entrepreneurship unit? What you know, How to get a hold of you and so on. Um, I don't know if you want to just share that quickly before we yeah. leave. Okay, guys. So if you want to reach me, the quickest, fastest way to reach me is to just go to the entrepreneurship unit website. If you just type in in Google, UE entrepreneurship unit, we are right up the top. You will see the entrepreneurship unit there, the website. Click on it and just scroll to the little icon that says register or scroll down um, and book an appointment. And you can get a virtual um, Zoom meeting with me and we can chat about your business um, and I can provide advice. And you can access myself as an advisor to you and your business anytime. I'm always available to students. In terms of where I'm located on, located on campus, um, right now I'm in the office of the campus principal. This is the office that I use now. It's um, in the office of the campus principal. That's the one next to the pool, the old sort of colonial style building. My office is just towards the back and students do come to me sometimes. Um, if they have projects, um, they definitely do. Um, usually the security will just ask you if you're coming to me, they say yes, and they say fine, go ahead. And that's it, right? But if you need to just meet me uh, virtually, Entrepreneurship Unit, just go there, UE Entrepreneurship Unit. Our website is right up top on the search, search results, and just click on register or click and or click on book an appointment. Okay, easy to reach. Thank you very much. <laughs> so guys, if you're interested in, in chatting more with Julian on, on a business idea or you have a business up and running, um, certainly very easy to get a hold of him. Um, and he's certainly making himself available. So that's a resource you can leverage. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you again, Julian. I think, I think yep. that's, we're, we're all done for this evening. And uh, for those of you who logged in, thank you very much. Uh, we resume our regular class next week. And for those of you in the boot camp, I wish you much success with your pitches and developing your ideas further. Um, so that's it for us on our end, I think. Have a good night, guys. Okay, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right.